Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. ¿Son las tardes? Um, good morning, afternoon. Um, I'm Dr. Marta Moreno Vega, uh, executive director and founder of the Caribbean Cultural Center African Diaspora Institute, as well as founding a participant in the Museo del Barrio, the Association of Hispanic Arts, Roundtable of People of Color, and so on. And during that process, I've also been a professor at different colleges, presently an adjunct um, in Randy's department and arts and public policy. And um, I want to speak about inquietudes. Inquietudes are things that make me feel uneasy. Because we all generally agree on what we feel good about, but we generally don't agree on where we feel uneasy. And I'm increasingly feeling uneasy about the use of community, mm -hmm. community engagement. And that started at a conference that uh, my sister, uh, Dr. Magnon, invited me to the College of uh, in California, right? College of uh, California Arts, uh, California College of the Arts, to participate in a conference about community engagement, civic engagement. And when I asked the students, I said, where are you? And generally, the students were uh, European-American, right? I said, where, what do you mean by community? What do you mean by community? And everybody was, oh, community is hard. Right, typical California. Community is hard, community is spirit. And I said, well, what community are you talking about? And it became clear that people are identifying community like we were using the term for minorities, right? It's like working in, in communities of color, poor communities, or disadvantaged, marginal communities. And people were not seeing themselves as part of community. And we're all part of community. And as I said in the video, what communities are valued in this country? We talk about diversity. We've had diversity forever. So diversity is used like, oh wow, I'm using a new term, diversity or multiculturalism in the 70s and 80s. Diversity has always been there, but we look around and the table still doesn't show what this nation is. So from that conference, I started thinking with Sonia and other people, what is happening? It's a wonderful thing that uh, community engagement is happening, civic engagement is happening at the higher end level. But once it detaches itself from meaning, in significance in terms of transforming community. And even using the word activism, new activism happening within the university. And what happens to the activists that are within communities? How are they valued and recognized? And how is it that we see community not as higher ed institutions? And I had this conversation with um, Carol from Ashe, right, and Cheryl. And we were talking, and I said, you know, you're a higher ed institution. Ashe is a higher ed institution. You are an instructor, you're a teacher. Any young person that comes through your doors is exposed to an intelligence that generally professors in the university do not have. <coughs> Because it's one thing to build an institution within a community that you reflect. And it's another to visit or observe and document the experience. So that Ashe is a higher ed institution. MOCA in Chinatown is a higher ed institution. So how is it that that intelligence is not valued in the same way. Yet, if you will, appropriated and co-opted by higher ed to develop a whole series of programs across the country that see the foundation of that academic thrust 
still as the other, still as going to community. There's something fundamentally wrong with that structure. Mm -hmm. And I understand the argument that says that, you know, within higher ed, community engagement, the seen as marginal, is still not seen as integral. So therefore, there has to be certain language developed to validate it. But because we are in a living room, and we're all together trying to think through how to move forward, and if you will, talk about movement building. Movement building happens when people are marginal, when people don't have, when people are invisible and not recognized, when the numbers tell us that across this country, if you look at African descendants, if you look at Latinos, if you look at Asians, Native Americans, our contributions in the building of this nation are critical, integral. So why is it still not seen as part of the whole? And I don't mean as part of the whole as looking homogenous, like, you know, a uh, milk. I'm saying how is it not seen as each thread being part of a tapestry that makes this nation what it is? Or what it should be? Or what it should become? And I think that because we're engaged in this work and well-meaning, we have the opportunity to have discussions that will create that change. The field is still new enough in academia that conversations that are critical, that change the dynamic, can happen. These conversations have always happened within our institutions because we have been building against the odds. And I'm very clear that if we don't have institutions grounded in community, and I don't care what that community is, the infrastructure of the feeling of being in a neighborhood is lost. The feeling of being part of a network is lost. And when higher ed functions within communities and sees itself as apart from that community. That includes NYU, right? Because how do we develop a partnership when NYU is expanding and gentrifying our own communities? Columbia, Iguay. New school, the same. And I'm sure across the country. So you're developing a partnership and killing me in the process? <laughs> Does that community become an idea, a theoretical idea, and not actual? It becomes virtual? So I think those are the things that we need to think about. And I thank Sonia because it really started me thinking when I went to that conference and young people, well-intended, doing beautiful work and wonderful work, always saw themselves as going to something and not a part of something. And had no investment in nurturing, protecting, and valuing the young activists that were developing within their own communities. So I would say that part of the task of thinking this through is how do we, as academics and community members and, and builders and, and members of institutions, have a different conversation that brings us all at the table and valuing our different intelligences in significant ways? How do we acknowledge community activists, community, right? or young people working within our institutions and develop credentials for them so they can continue this work within their communities. 
Why can't higher education institutions that are sending young people to the various places to learn not invest in those young people and bring them in on scholarships to the university to be credentialed? We're in the process, and Randy and Sonia and uh, Amalia Misabains, uh, Jack, and all of us have been talking about the notion of a community arts university without walls. The idea being that you can create learning, significant learning that transforms communities in any location by engaging institutions on the ground, by engaging people who are about transformation, and engaging those people who are studying and researching in ways that can affect whatever issues that group of people, that cultural group, if you will, that ethnic group, needs to address. So that institutions are broader than its walls. And institutions of the ground are broader than its walls. So that we can develop linkages that affect change, lasting change. Because, and, and I'll end my comments with this, is how is it possible that after 50 years or better that this movement emerged, right? Community arts coming out of the civil rights movement because that's a whole other conversation. We built institutions with meaning to change this country. This country would not be talking about equity. It would not be talking about, you know, destruction of racism, the dismantling of discrimination and different systems if it hadn't been for the civil rights movement. So how, 50 years after this movement, the institutions that were at the forefront of this is still hurting and still not valued? That's an issue. And I hope you will engage in correcting that issue. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Sonia Bashima Manon, and I'm currently Vice President of Institutional Partnerships at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Um, formerly the director of the Center for Art and Public Life at the California College of the Arts, um, which is where most of the work that I have done around uh, these collaborations and partnerships with student community civic engagement um, sort of got its legs, but that's not where I enter into the discussion or the conversation regarding creating change. Um, before I became an academic, before I became an administrator, I was actually a performer in dance. And in dance, for those of you who do dance, it's, it's very hard to have a voice that um, can articulate narratives, that can articulate issues, um, because it's, it's not verbal, but it's, it's a very uh, poignant form of art and I think that it's, it's one that many people don't come to view with an understanding of what is this person saying through movement. And so as a dancer, it was really hard to articulate the type of art that I wanted to portray in terms of cultural identity, narrative stories. And from there, I went into um, uh, videography <coughs> photography, which in videography, you can have a voice. In photography, sometimes you can't have that audio voice. Um, but my sort of uh, uh, trajectory, my, my both personal and professional tra trajectory has been through arts, working in local arts agencies, and then going into um, academia as a professor and as a, a, a convener of activities, a director of a center, 
and um, throughout the last 20 years, Martha and I have been constantly challenging each other and challenging others around this whole notion of, of what does it mean to engage civically with communities, with cultures, with people, and, and how do you do that respectfully? Um, so while at California College of the Arts, I developed a academic program, a BFA in community arts. And the preface behind that was to give students um, an opportunity to learn from the community. And so many of the faculty that I brought in to teach at CCA were actually artists and community activists who were actually working with our students um, to then introduce them into the whole notion of why do you go and work in a community and um, how do you respectfully do that and it's not just uh, an internship that I'm going to do for a semester and get my degree and get my grade and then I'm going to go off and do the real work, whatever that real work is. But it was really to work with students that were committed to and engaged in working in various communities and, and I'm very proud to say that many of my students that have graduated have continued to work in communities in New York, in Australia, in Japan, have continued that um, commitment and that sustainability to the actual work and working in communities and, and partnering. Um, the, the conference that Martha alluded to in 2006 was crafting a vision for art equity and civic engagement, um, convening the community arts field in higher ed. And that was done in 2006 on the West Coast where there were a number of institutions that were doing the same work that Imagining America was doing on the East Coast. And we were having these very hard discussions about what does it mean to work with community partners and, and what does reciprocality really mean and how do you do that. Um, and so I edited um, a publication after that that was actually a compilation of essays from our community partners, from students, from higher ed um, professors that, that actually challenged us to think about what does this mean. And Martha was one of the keynotes and she really rocked our world, you know, when she said to our students, what do you mean? You know, what, what does community mean to you? How are you working in community? And as art students will do, you know, a lot of the comments were it's heartfelt, it's soul work, you know, it was the very untangible thing because they were grappling with that very same idea of what does this mean for me to do that work. And um, so fast forward to uh, a number of discussions that we've had here in New York um, with a number of individuals uh, that are in the audience, Dudley, um, Jamie Haft, um, Jan, Jan Cohen Cruz, you know, about what's the other side of the equation and what are the organizations dealing with? How are they sustaining? You know, what is the both historical and economic context by which these organizations have survived or barely survived over the last 30 years? And so we began working on um, a snapshot, which is a publication that was just released, and it's, it's in the back, and it'll be here at the uh, convening all weekend. And it's landmarking community cultural arts organizations nationally, the impact of public policy on community arts funding. Because what we felt was, we're doing all this work in terms of higher ed institutions to partner with these community arts organizations, but what is the sustainability of these organizations and what is their story, what is their narrative. And so this work took four <laughs> years to compile because we actually went to 12 organizations across the country and spent time with them in dialogue saying what is your narrative and what is your story and what has the national landscape of funding and public policy been on your ability to continue to do the work that you've been doing over the last 30 years. And it was really incredible to find out how, when we look at, starting from the civil rights movement, and the funding policies and the um, funding agencies that began to fund our community organizations, 
Um, and then when the economy starts to dip, that money just like disappears. And our organizations are left faced with, okay, how do we survive? Because we're actually the lifeblood of the community that we're serving. And if we close our doors, then there's going to be a lot of devastation in these communities. Um, so it was, um, it's a 30 year look, it's a 30 year narrative from the founders, many of whom will not be with us much longer, um, the artistic directors uh, that have labored extremely hard over the last 30 years to maintain the work that is done in community and to now begin to invite higher ed, to invite the academy into their doors in a partnership that did not start from their perspective. And so they're getting us, and I do, since I'm an, an institution that's doing that, I'm associate professor, visiting associate professor in theater, and so I teach classes that are actually working in the communities of Middletown with the organizations that have been there for many years. And so the organizations are now faced with how do we then allow students and allow higher ed into our homes to do some work that is a benefit to the students because they're working on degrees, but is also to the benefit of our communities, not necessarily the organization, but how does this benefit our communities and how does this sustain the work that we're doing. So it's a very critical dialogue and conversation that we're having. Um, organizations such as Imagining America, I think it's, it's very critical that we continue to critique ourselves in doing this work. And we continue to allow the organizations to have a major voice at the table, a major voice. We hear from the academics, we hear from the students. We really have to allow the organizations to have a major voice at the table and to sort of pave a new way of what it means to do civic engagement and community partnerships. All right, so this conference is posed as an inquiry, posed as a question. Linked fates and futures communities and campuses as equitable partners. So throughout the course of these three days, we're really here to put that question on the table, including asking what are the terms by which that linkage might take place. And I wanted just to, to think a little bit about the, the historical moment that makes this linkage even possible or conceivable. And that is to say, an undoing of a social compact that pertained, I think, to higher education, to nonprofit organizations, and to community as such. And what we're seeing is that we're going through a crisis. And as is often the case with crisis, crisis is often used as a way of exacerbating the problem that precipitated the crisis to begin with. So how we come out of this crisis, whether we come out with a better, stronger foundation, a stronger linkage, uh, depends on how we understand what got us into this place. So I want to think through a little bit what are the terms of these three social compacts. First, starting out with the social compact around higher education, thinking about this moment emerging out of the Second World War when, if we recall, you know, if you were largely white and male, you had a free ticket to higher education. This was a, a race and gendered and class uh, compromise that allowed for an incredible kind of social mobility. Um, and that social mobility was built around the notion of a knowledge society and the creation of something called a professional managerial class. The idea was if you could get access to college, you would gain specialized expertise, and that expertise would allow you to govern, through governing your own knowledge, something of your fate and the society would depend upon that uh, technical expertise, each person looking after their own sort of private interest around that expertise, and somehow that would serve the public good. So, public, so higher education then also was accompanied by this massive expansion of public education, of subsidized tuition, and this was also seen as something that was a, a, a civic purpose. 
right, of, of building a population, of building uh, participation. So needless to say, what was once seen as a public good has now become a private good. That education is seen not as a way of building knowledge for all through a kind of disciplinary division of labor, a partition between what belonged to the disciplines and what belonged to others with the confidence that if you could separate the purity of knowledge for itself, it would find its application in the world and therefore of a separation between the university and the rest of the world and a confidence in the sanctity of that separation. That now what we've seen rolling forward, and this is really starting with the 1980s when we can start to trace the sort of undoing of that social compact. Uh, probably the key piece of legislation in this was the Bayh-Dole Act, which said that if universities got money from government, they could, uh, and they uh, patented the results of their research, they could keep that money as part of their own funding. Right? So this is part of a shift in a sense that education is no longer uh, a public good either for the universities or the individuals, it's a private good for the individuals, it's an investment that's going to return in terms of lifetime earnings, and for universities, it's a race to see who can win at a game of intellectual property. So that certainly happens. <coughs> universities increase their patents sevenfold, but you could say tragically, intellectual property and patents to universities is only 5% of the general number of patents given. So the university basically enters into this Faustian bargain where it trades off what was unique about higher education, education for itself, to become part of a larger <clears throat> knowledge sector, knowledge industry, in which it is decreasingly competitive, uh, except uh, at the very top. And when we look at the concentration of, of research monies, the concentration of endowments, um, the top 1% of endowments of universities are 50% of the total number of endowments. Right? The same kind of inequality that we see across the board, we're also seeing with respect to higher education. So what was once a great engine of upward, of upward mobility has, because of the translation from public to private goods, become an engine of debt. And that debt is borne unevenly depending upon the status of the people who enter into the university. So we have a kind of pyrrhic situation where greater access than ever before, the creation of, of more uh, professionals than ever before, professionals and man management is uh, almost 40% of the workforce, up from about 11% in 1960, but that vaunted autonomy and self-governance that was the promise of that knowledge has now been lost. And I would say the result, as we see, is a series of crises, not just of economy, but of knowledge as such. We can understand the financial crisis in part of a failure of those very mathematical models that were supposed to deliver finance to all, serving masters that were indifferent to that knowledge. We see ecological and environmental crises in which there were supposed to be the same kinds of models of risk management that pertained in the financial fields failing to prevent the horrendous consequences of oil spills, but also the whole question of what our ecology and our environmental relationships are if there is to be knowledge that's only serving itself and proprietary interests. And finally, a crisis of political knowledge. A greater gulf of perspective around a narrowing field of what counts as legitimate political ideas. And so even though we have a highly polarized uh, political situation, probably in policy terms, there's never been a more narrow sphere, one could say, of the differences in policy pronouncements. And I think in some ways we heard that tragically in the uh, presentation of the debate the other night, narrowly focused around questions of tax exemption. And this leads me to the next compromise of the social compact, that around the nonprofits. Right, nonprofits become codified in the 1950s, but really they're to solve the problem of the great society expansion in the 1960s, which is how do you get more social benefit without increasing the role of government? Right? So the idea of nonprofits, of course, is that they were the third sector, the third way, a space in between the public and private, 
justify and legitimating their activity in terms of a public good. But there too, the Faustian bargain was that that public good was going to come at, uh, through tax exemption. So the very thing that's to serve the public sector is also eviscerating that public sector. And if you look at the impact now, um, 40 year, over 40 years on from the 1969 uh, Tax Reform Act, which did a lot to democratize philanthropy, who, who supposedly could participate uh, in this third sector. And again, in 1981, under the Reagan administration, the shifting, the further expansion of eligibility for tax exemption, which came with a $110 billion tax uh, uh, benefits cut to nonprofits. You see that in many ways, despite all the good that individual nonprofits do, the sector is also eviscerating the role of government, the, the possibility of posing what a public good is, and a kind of maldistribution of resources. The people who make a million dollars or more receive almost 500,000 in tax cuts. But what's pernicious about this relationship is that those who receive the biggest benefit in terms of tax exemptions for mortgages and for healthcare benefits usually do not self-identify as even receiving government benefits, leaving only those who receive the smallest share of those benefits, and that share has been declining, as we all know, those marked as, as, uh, um, as poor, uh, with uh, food stamps and uh, aid to the family, families with dependent children uh, uh, shrinking. <coughs> But those are the folks who are marked as dependent uh, in, in the famous 47%, while the lion's share of, res of government and public resources are, are secreted away in an un unacknowledged fashion. So we want to ask, where does that leave us with a, a government that is then deprived and eviscerated of its capacity to articulate what are the judgments that are of benefit to all? So I think this becomes a huge challenge, given that both Nonprofit education uh, and nonprofits, in terms of foundations, are supposed to be the economic salvation to the problem of a depleted public sector. Um, and then, third, if we think about community, the community social compact is probably less formal than the other two, uh, but was certainly earned through these various social movements that emerged in the 1960s. I want to think about a community in, in, in perhaps a curious way. Um, as uh, movements of decolonization. And what was being decolonized was a whole series of enclosures, enclosures of what counted as nature, of rural spaces, of the third world, of spaces of domesticity and reproduction and identity, which joined together gender, sexuality, and race. And that the decolonization movements were also about insisting that there was ways of knowing otherwise. And that those forms of knowing were themselves not just the private disciplinary knowledge, the cognitive mindful knowledge, but an embodied form of knowledge, a knowledge that moved people, that forced people to action. So we're talking about an opening of a knowledge sphere that was driven through community arts and culture, that had a material form, that also then became key to the notion of what a good life could be. A good life could not be lived without arts and culture. And at the same time, culture stopped being the compensatory realm. It became its own new frontier of the marketplace. So we can tell the same story that starts to emerge in the 1980s of this knowledge society taking over culture as its own new frontier. So patterns of development are to be formed around ideas of a creative class, of creative cities, of creative industries, of urban branding, all of which culture is being used instrumentally to position people, just like universities and cities, according to rank. But the content of that culture disappears. And culture just becomes something to which is an investment to which value is added without asking what culture, what difference does it make, where it comes from, so that you gain positioning, supposedly, in the creative city's ranking by having more creatives, but the creatives aren't do to do anything. And indeed, that notion of what's appealing about the creative class is that artists and community members are infinitely flexible. They're so flexible, they don't even need health care. <laughs> they don't need wages. 
they work for free, they work out of love. So I think this then leads us to the challenge for Imagining America. In what way can Imagining America take a leadership role in refiguring, in reconfiguring what this social compact would be if the existing ones lie in tatters and our opportunity exists to reconfigure these relationships, to relink ourselves along the lines of a new social compact by developing the critical knowledge and frameworks that we need to imagine a different kind of future. Thank you very much. After that, that was an incredible session. I wish we had And it's clear that it's time for some healing. We need to get we need to get outside. And I'm here with a modest uh, partial but effective solution. <laughs> Professor Jack's <laughs> tips for street savvy urban walking, or how not to look like a tourist, and sort of pass as a New Yorker results very. How to look good and feel fine while decartesianizing your mind, body, and spirit. I am here to talk to you about a serious affliction that has victimized virtually every single person in this lecture room. How many of you, first of all, are left-handed? Could you wait, raise your hand? Okay. Show, show your hands. Okay, keep your hands up. How many of you are only right-handed? Only right-handed. Keep your hands up. Okay. Did you realize that all of you are suffering from what Michelle Sayers has diagnosed as hemiplegia? In other words, you're one-sided. <laughs> one and this affliction uh, is not bad enough by itself, but how many in this room are ABDs? ABDs, raise your hands, okay. PhDs, raise your hands. Uh, PhDs with in, in tenure track positions. Okay, and PhDs who are tenured. Okay, so, okay, all of you, including myself, suffer from FLOCD, which is frontal lobe obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you there is hope. And since you've already paid your registration fee for this conference, I will provide you free of charge the secret therapeutic cure to this deadening disability. I will share the secret of the walking cure. You can do this anywhere, but I, Dr. Jack, recommend it in New York City, where the curing vibes are the strongest anywhere, and the incentive to walk is the greatest. So when you venture forth right after this session into the streets of New York City, where throngs of people actually share the civic commons, we in New York City call it sidewalks in some ways. <laughs> Keep in mind the tips I'm sharing with you uh, on how to practice walking with uh, other people on the sidewalk in New York City, first, first of all, and not bumping into them, um, to cleanse our hyperactive, overly developed frontal lobes. Thereby learning how to rediscover our bodies, decolonize our minds, and fly with our spirits. Step after step after step. You really need care in here. In a short while, you'll be, you'll be feeling better. To reconnect your toes with your fingers, the lower body with your upper toso, torso, your pelvis with the James Brown in us all. <laughs> step after step after step will reconnect how you sense the present with the past, the present with the future, and the future with the past. You will know you are on the road to recovery. When on Broom Street you start seeing the spirit of Jane Jacobs, you will know you are on the way to recovery. When on 125th Street you hear the syncopated blues song of James Baldwin, you will know you're on the way to recovery. And when the, at the Shelvins by the Manhattan Bridge you smell the brine and feel the presence of the Lenny Lenape peoples, you will know you're on the way to recovery. Once you leave this building, try to develop your New York City walking practice with the following four walking exercises.
Michel de Sarteau begins his practice of everyday life from the 110th floor of the World Trade Center, looking down at the ant-like pathways creatures make below. From these commanding heights, all that is solid melts into air. Not even King Kong, Godzilla, the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man, nor the Joker could conquer a mammon. From the vantage, uh, you can glean the industrious beaver, the Protestant ethic, uh, the property self-owning Viagra, uh, heteronormative proper citizen, the machine in the garden, the ghost in the machine, all energizing a grid. <laughs> The hills are moved to fill the wetlands. The microclimates disappear to enhance the uniform business atmosphere. The ever uptown land rush up Fifth Avenue leaves the dirty, wretched downtown behind. The canal opening up the heartland, the port of New York grows exponentially. The exchange of pelts for tools of making shells into wampum, the mint moves from the marge to the Federal Reserve. The digital binaries that stream through these cables which run along the rail tracks right of ways, the cables which lead to vast rooms of superheating servers, surge juice into our lovely iPads and Androids. We, after all, are advocates of the much fantasized, clean, cutting edge, creative informational economy which New Yorkers operate from a higher, better 111th floor. This is the progress narrative generated by the growth machine. A CEO billionaire mayor will run the city as a multinational corporation and become the savior to all of, the, all of New York City's troubles. Our retrospective aura of Manhattan today and using a mythical past of baubles traded for Manhattan Island still stunts our reckoning with this colonized place so many of us call home. Slurp, slurp. <laughs> Walking exercise number two, the discernible below the commanding heights. There are eight million stories in the naked city. It's the street level neighborhood view mythologized every day in relation to the view from on high. It's a story within the story of the every man and the every woman struggling with their bosses and their bosses' bosses to find a place in this big place. This is the life navigating within the grid, digging the canals. If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere, goes the Muzak soundtrack. Horatio Elger pulled himself up from his bootstraps, and so can you. These are the mean streets of Martin Scorsese, where gangs of Irishmen fight Protestant natives down in the Five Points, impressing Cameron Diaz so all will become Americans. <laughs> you have Little Italy, Chinatown down. You have Spanish Harlem and Sylvie's, uh, Sylvia's Fried Chicken up, uh, and the Apollo Theater up. You've got Jackie Gleason driving the bus topside, his, kick side, his sidekick Ed Norton fixing the sewers below the butcher, the tailor, the candlestick maker. Immigrant New York, a land of mediated memory through the airwaves, through family stories, through adventures, regaled to friends from the safety of middle America. This story is one of arrival and going back in time to prove why the arrival was good and wise. It was a narrow heritage politics, yet one of the few public tracks available in the public sphere digestible West Side stories, the romantic Shakespearean tragedies of city life. This is the nostalgia for tastes, smells, the pungency to everyday life. I am told the visitors of the Tenement Museum, the children and grandchildren of immigrants, now searching for some connections to their heritage, draw a sharp line between their ancestors, the good hardworking immigrants, and the imagined 47 percenters, the bad immigrants of today. This past-present disjunction is part of our collective pelagic affliction. Yet, just like those who take the subways understand when they are generally safe and crowded, like at 1 a.m. in the morning, deal with the realities. Those who are not here dissociate themselves from making these connections. Exercise number three, the exclusive below or excuse me, the elusive below. 
Uh, the elusive below is made up of two parts. One is movements. Against the steady orchestration from on high, against the pop songs of the Tower of Babel, plays the folk anthem, the outrage against the machine, the DIY cool of Woody and Pete, the Ramones and Patty, and Erica DeFranco, Toshi Reagan, all sang downtown <coughs> underground. Tourists are wandering around at this moment, looking for that uh, what once was aspiring musicians wanting to live out their glory. If the Wasp story of the high-def master panorama vision, the Ken Burns effect, scanning from top to down, if the naked city is the taste, the smells, the exotic, the funky, the down-home, then surely movement New York City is the slogans and the truth to power of Union Square rallies and Zuccotti Park's 99%. This is the fluid city constantly strategizing where the most symbolic protest uh, opportunities avail. The next part, subaltern, those without formal power. Fragments, shadows, fringes, edges, their omnipresent absence, points of a systemic invisibility. Your gleaning skills have to be especially acute here. The production of history expresses political and cultural power while also actively silencing other versions. In this sense, the quote, winner is a certain noisy version of history and emerges as a master narrative and a master history. History writes trio can be silencing when facts, archives, narratives, and histories are absented at the very moment in which history is being produced. He identifies four crucial moments in each registering uh, space in the place of New York City. One, the moment of fact creation, the making of sources. Two, the moment of fact assembly, the making of archives. Three, the moment of fact retrieval, the making of narratives. And four, the moment of retrospective significance, the making of history in the final instance. Visuality, according to the philosopher Immanuel Kant, was a master aesthetic sense. Rationality and visuality have been tightly linked. As visual culture theorist uh, Nicholas uh, Mirzoff has demonstrated, quote, visuality and its visualizing of history are part of how the West historicizes and distinguishes itself from its others. The subaltern cannot speak. In contrast, the proximate senses, those of touch, taste, smell, were deemed the lower animal senses. The visual became the sense of civilization. What can be seen on the surface of power and knowledge justified notions of class, gender, and racial superiority, such as the visual ideology of what philosopher Charles Mills has called the racial contract. In effect, speaking and storytelling is a borderline between the so-called superior sense of sight and the lower animal senses. Trujillo's framing offers an analysis of this key sensate dimension, that of sound and silence. As you move through the in-between, not generally noticed spaces, can you begin to discern a subaltern presence? Finally, walking exercise number four. These images are in canon a place we vaguely recognize, but not. Where is this green oasis, this Eden just to the east, and further still lies heaven, the land of many hills in Lenape, Manhattan. Part of a vast estuary, an intertidal zone between land and sea, what the Dutch called the marge, the border zone, full of life, giant lobsters, 18-inch oysters, birds, nuts, berries, a breeze sweet and tender. One observer in 1630 wrote, quote, birds fill the woods so that men can scarcely go through them for the whistling, the noise, and the chatter. Seventy kinds of trees, 627 species of plants, 85 species of fish, 32 of reptiles and amphibians, 233 of birds, 24 of mammals, 50 different ecological niches with 573 hills. Manhattan, Manhattan, the land between the hills. 
on the marge, the Lenny Lenape made centuries worth of shell middens and cultivated the three sisters corn, squash, and beans. Now I see, uh, this, is, this is Walt Whitman, of course, now I see what there is in a name, a word, liquid, sane, unruly, musical, and self-sufficient. I see that the word of my city is that word from, uh, from abode, because I see the word nestled in nests of water babes, superb. Manhattan is also the name of a project of devotion by Eric Sanderson, conservation ecologist with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Sanderson explains, the goal of the Manhattan project has never been to return Manhattan to its primeval state. The goal of the project is to discover something new about a place we all know so well, whether we live in New York or see it on television, and through that discovery, to alter our way of life. New York does not lack for dystopian visions of the future, but what is the vision of the future that works? This is a worthy example of holding two moments in time and place in reflexive thinking. The present and the past are in dialogic tension. We are invited to explore and ask questions. New York, the New York Times cultural critic at large, Edward Rothstein, trained at the University of Chicago, mentored by Alan Bloom, is moved yet quite uneasy with this assertion. For him, the take home is all human interactions shape, shape the environment. The Lenape, the British soldiers transmuting the island's timber into arm, an armed fortress, the 1811 grid, or the skyscrapers of modernity are all equivalent. They're all the same in Rothstein's view because they are people impacting the environment. In Rothstein's reinterpretation of Sanderson, we skip over the details of a foundational historical non sequitur. John Locke did not consider native peoples as self-possessed uh, owners of property. They he, uh, they, he claimed, did not cultivate the land. They lived off the land. They were part of the natural history. Therefore, they're part of the natural history of the museum. This is pure rationalist obliviousness. The obliviousness caused, caused a constant replay of the first injustice. We can see the manifest destiny stories of Western civilization advance in superiority expressed by Daniel Chester French's sculptures, for example, when you walk by the New York City, custom, uh, the New York City Customs House downtown. These blind spots also flourish at a place like NYU where to this day we do not have a program, let alone a department in Native People's Studies, nor a core curriculum that examines an interdynamic understanding of New York City, a fair, informed, and rigorous understanding of dispossession and violation that the city is built upon. So here is the dilemma. Academic subject, uh, subject positions are severely limited. We are deeply collegiate. This is how often a blind faith that content-focused, correct analysis somehow will free us. Books, essays, lectures are critically important, but they are hardly enough. As you walk out into the city, visiting communities and community-based organizations, try to sense how non-academics express their relations with uh, academia? Do they register a disconnect? Do they assert an independent, less academic way of knowing? Uh, do they, do, uh, does that translate? Uh, how do they translate their work for you so you can understand it uh, as you imagine you're doing for them? Who knows, who knows what? Uh, is there trust built? What relationships are developed? Is the, is the discourse mainly book learning or more? What are the principles of community university collaboration? Is it sustained over more than a year, for example? What can we, uh, based in the universities, do to have more honest, more reciprocal, and better relationships? Eric Sanderson has created an uploaded app for his mapping of Manhattan called uh, uh, Walikyo, a Lenape for My Good Home. You can click on a parcel of land, for example, on his map, and watch it go from its present streets and buildings of New York City back to 1609, 
the moment before Hudson arrived. This time-space juxtaposition opens up the, the imagination and invites discussion, invites us in. I am envisioning an app with a pair of Google glasses, infused with insights and populated by historical ghosts. This is the type of collaborative project students and community people can work on together. This is not simply technology, but a vision crammed full of historical and creative tidbits that can inspire engage, uh, engaged critical public dialogues. I close with this question. Can we develop an Imagining America style walking practice that engages all our senses, linking the best of academic and community-based knowledge in a shared, trustworthy understanding of New York City in its daily contestations, land use, and meaning making. Can we create engaged, intelligent, uh, soulful, truly sensate connections? This is the challenge of democracy's public engaged work, and this is the challenge of Democracies University. So enjoy the beautiful weather we have today. It's like the only time that we've had a beautiful day for the past <laughs> week, and the coming days are going to rain again. Uh, it's a perfect day for the site visits. Uh, have fun. I hope you have many adventures out there. And remember, I take no responsibility for any mishaps. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and have a great day. conferences in 2006 and, and um, I kept coming back because like a lot of people who enjoy this conference you know after going through a year in the trenches and whatever we're doing you come to this conference and feel inspired again and pumped up for another another 12 months out there uh, doing the work and I, we're like two hours into it I feel like I could go home I'm like I don't I can't even imagine what the next couple of days are going to be like you know I didn't get a chance first of all thank you Jack that was wonderful and I didn't get a chance before to say again because of excusing the Harlem folks but my goodness to be inspired and profoundly challenged um, as a way to spark these next three days. I just want to again thank Marta and Sonia and Randy for an amazing opening. Now let the games begin. We are going to start. Um, uh, Kitty and